Welcome back friends. In this video tutorial, we'll be talking about uh, the infectivity of Clostridium botulinum. We've already talked about Clostridium species, the general introductory video about the Clostridium species. So you can go and that kind of uh, introductory video can be applicable for any kind of Clostridium species. So don't worry about that. But in this video, we'll be specially talking about the type of infections caused by Clostridium botulinum. And there is only one answer for that. There is only one answer. The answer is that the Clostridium botulinum usually it causes botulism. So let me write botulism. This is the big disease that, are, that, that is caused by Clostridium botulism, uh, this particular strain. Now this bacteria is a very, very important uh, clinical significance. So it carries very important clinical significance because this, this bacteria is causing this botulism disease and, uh, and it is causing this disease using only one important material only one for one important thing and that thing is that thing is the most potent so let me write the most potent toxin known till now most potent toxin in world and that toxin is termed as botulism toxin so it should be you, botulism toxin or botulinum toxin, whatever. Now this toxin is the most dangerous and most potent type of toxin still available for humankind. Okay, now this toxin almost single-handedly can cause all the different kinds of diseases and symptoms because it was suggested, it was found that even if in, during the infection, if there is no, uh, there is no presence of Clostridium botulinum bacteria, but still if there is a presence and of minute tra tra trace of this botulinum toxin, that is going to cause this disease uh, in, in same kind of way if uh, the Clostridium botulinum present in the same way, right? So it is not required uh, for, for the onset of this, this kind of botulism infection, it is not required that the Clostridium botulinum always presents the endotoxin, uh, the exotoxin, not endotoxin, it's an exotoxin can do the work. So let me write, it's an exotoxin. So this exotoxin or presence of this exotoxin will do the work. It will cause botulism, right? Now the botulism uh, can be divided into three different kinds. So let me talk about each of them here. We'll be talking about them. Now another thing I must tell you that this Clostridium uh, botulinum, this kind of bacteria, usually they live in soil. So they live in soil. So they are a kind of soil microorganisms. So this, uh, if, if, if any reason, if by any mean uh, we have infected or if we have contaminated our food source. So let me talk about food source. So food source is very very important part. So due to a mishandling of the foods and uh, less processivity of the foods, if anyhow this kind of bacteria can move from the soil to food source, in those cases it can contaminate us, it can cause diseases in human being. Otherwise it won't, right? And it is uh, pretty common that this kind of disease is shown in infants. It is also pretty common because infants usually drink milk and also they uh, they take uh, honey in all these cases. Uh, now this Clostridium botulinum can stay there for longer period of time, time in these environments. So most of the Clostridium infections that we will be encountering are from uh, the contamination from soil to food and then we take up this food and then the infection will be caused, right? Now this botulism can be divided into three different sections or three different parts. So the first part is called as classical, classical botulism. The second part is called as the second one is called as infant, infant botulism. And the third type of botulism is called as, so let me write, the third type is called as wound botulism. Wound botulism. So these are the three types of botulism that are available. Now in case of the classical botulism, this is a typical uh, case of botulism where it, it arises from a contaminated food. So let me write, from contaminated contaminated food food source okay and uh, for the infants uh, this infant kind of now no, uh, for and also also uh, it is coming from contaminated food uh, and this this is common in adults too so you can see this classical kind in adults most of the time and this kind of infection can be seen uh, from 12 to 36 hour of the injection hour of the infection actually of the infection okay 
we are going to see the different symptoms. Now, symptoms like muscle spasm, right? Now, usually I forgot to mention that what is botulism? Botulism is a kind of uh, paralysis. It's a form of paralysis. So, let me write. It's a kind of paralysis. Where should I write? Uh, I must write it below here. So, kind of paralysis. Now, in this kind of paralysis, you you can you you lost your ability to reconstruct uh, the muscle, right? So, unable to con contract muscle. So, unable to contract muscle. This kind of paralysis is caused due to the toxicity of Clostridium toxin. Uh, and some other cases, uh, there are also other kind of paralysis caused by different types of bacteria, like uh, one is uh, can be caused by tetanus bacteria, Clostridium tetani. And in those kind of paralysis, that is a kind of spastic paralysis. In those cases, you will be unable uh, to recontract your muscle. That means if your muscle is getting contracted, that form will be stayed for an extensive period of time. Right? But in this case, you will be unable to contract your muscle. That's the difference between the tetanus toxin poisoning as well as the botulinum toxin poisoning. Okay. Now, both of them are paralysis, but the tetanus toxic paralysis is called, so let me write here, this is very, very important, but the tetanus, so tetanus toxin poisoning is called as, this kind of paralysis is called as or termed as, so let me write, it is termed as a spastic paralysis because it it is uh, it, it giving rise to it is giving rise to kind of muscle spasm so it is called spastic paralysis but in case of in case of clostridium botulinum in case of botulinum it usually causes flaccid flaccid paralysis okay now in this case of flaccid paralysis we are talking about unable to contract the muscle right and this is due to uh, the signaling problem between your muscle and the nerve ending or nerve junction right or neuromuscular junction so it kind of kind of problem in so let me write kind of problem in neuromuscular <laughs> neuromuscular junction Okay, so that's very, very important. Okay, now we are going to see what is the exact problem that is uh, being encountered by host body when they are uh, subjected to this kind of clostridium toxin. Anyways, now this is among the classical type, which is the most common one. Now, second one is the infant botulism. Now, this infant botulism nowadays is a very common in the United States. So, it's a very common or in fact, it is the most common in USA. Okay. And in this kind of botulism, what we can see is that uh, the cause of, uh, it's also called as, uh, the result of this kind of botulism is also called floppy baby, floppy baby syndrome, floppy baby syndrome, okay. Now, in this case, this botulism is affecting uh, infants. The infants of 3 to 24 week of age, right? The toxin produced is slowly absorbed by their intestine. And then finally, their intestinal wall is becoming very, very tight and thick. And they start uh, to die in those cases, right? So, it's a very kind of tragic situation because it is causing uh, the newborn uh, to stiff their muscles in many regions or, or lose their ability to stiff the muscles. And actually, this kind of infection begins at the large bubble. So, begin, so let me write, begins at large bubble. Okay. Okay. And among this classical also, let me talk about a very important part about this uh, classical type. Because in this case of classical type, uh, this any any kind of whatever you take contaminated food and all these things. In all these cases, uh, the infection usually begins at the gastrointestinal tract. It usually begins at the GI tract, and then the infection starts and starts spreading from one place to another place. That's that's how it's done actually. Now in infants also it is uh, first begins at the large bowel, then it moves and finally it comes to the uh, it comes uh, it comes to stiffening of the muscle and also uh, uh, inability to contract the muscle. Right. 
Now, third one is a wound botulism. This is a very, very rare. So, let me write very rare. So, it's a very rare kind of situation, but still, this kind of situation can be seen. Now, in this case, uh, the infection. So, infection begins. Infection begins via wound. Right? Infection begins via wound. Okay. And again, from this wound, uh, the infection for the onset of the infection there uh, there can be materials like say say toxin is only material that we require so either bacteria or toxin whatever enters there they start causing the disease or uh, start providing the symptoms for you right now all these things remember uh, th th this this muscle contraction thing is important right but it, it also important that in which muscle this botulism toxin is acting now if it is the muscle of your heart if it is the muscle of your respiratory tra respiratory region if it's the muscle of your diaphragm in those cases it will surely lead to your death which is happening in classical uh, kind of botulism where the death rate is almost 15 percent so the mortality mortality is almost 50 15 percent there right or more than 15 percent so it is very important that where they are causing the infections but again uh, this toxin is a dangerous so in the future video we'll be talking about the mechanism of this pathogenicity by this clostridium toxin okay so that's it and i hope that's helpful thank you okay guys so we've already seen the infectivity of clostridium botulinum using its toxin now in this uh, particular video we are interested in knowing the mechanism of the clostridium toxin to cause the infection, right? So let us talk about uh, the pathogenesis. The pathogenesis. Pathogenesis of clostridium botulinum. Now, before understanding the pathogenesis by uh, the botulinum toxin, what we need to understand is how the nerve impulse uh, helps in contracting our uh, muscles or muscle cells right so let us talk about that first so for this particular detail what we need to understand is this concept let's say let's say here it is let's say uh, okay so let's say here it is this is the nerve ending for example let's say this is the nerve ending and here somewhere here this is the nerve ending so nerve ending means uh, let me talk about it further that uh, there the nerve construction is something like that let's say we are having axons and dendrons remember so we are having a cell body now from the cell body we are having axons coming out uh, sorry dendrons coming out like that and then we are having axon going out like that okay and at the end this now the axon will interact with the dendron or dendrite of the second of the second so let, let, let us talk about of the second no, neuron and then again from that second neuron again axon comes out so there is the interaction like that right throughout the place and at the end of this nerve interactions there is a barrier or region where we call call it as a neuromuscular junction so let me write we call it a neuro so let me write neuro muscular junction right now this neuromuscular junction means we are having this axons or dendrons whatever these are coming out so usually axons coming out so let's say here the axons are coming out and in between the axon what we are having we are having also muscles so let's say here we are having muscles right so here we are having muscles and axons uh, terminal is this so we are having axon terminal like that so this kind of place that we have drawn here this place is termed as here neuromuscular junction in this case right now this neuromuscular junction is very important place because in this case all the signaling on crosstalk is going on between our nervous system and the muscle system because we know that for the proper activity and reactivity and for the proper reflex actions we know for the proper reflex actions uh, to conduct what we need to have we need to have a coordinate approach or coordinate uh, interaction between our nerve ending and the muscle cells and that can be achieved and this neuromuscular junction right now suppose this is the neuromuscular junction and here let's say let's draw our muscle let's draw it here so let's say here it is our muscle like that okay this is the muscle whatever striated fibers and muscle so yeah this is the muscle so let me write this is 
muscle and this is the neuromuscular junction and this is axon terminal right so we know that these are the things which are important this is axon terminal right now usually what happens is that inside this axon terminal what we are having we are having some important chemical components now those chemical components generally help uh, to to transfer some chemical information from this axon terminal to the muscle cell which is telling this muscle cell to contract right for, so so for basic simple example is that it is providing some signal so let me write providing some signal in the form of chemical which is telling the muscle to contract so let me write contract right so this is the part now let's look at the detail now inside this axon terminal we are having certain chemicals right now the chemicals are made from with which it is made with two important components one is choline so let me write one is choline other one is acetyl coa now both of them choline and acetyl coa in the mixture of them will give rise to acetylcholine so let let us talk about this thing is an acetylcholine molecule now there are a lot of acetylcholine molecules that are generated like that right and they are put inside a vehicle they put inside a vehicle let's say this is the vehicle they put inside so let us talk about it let us mark them so let us say these are acetylcholine now this acetylcholine uh, and there are also other chemical molecules which can bring this signal from a nerve ending uh, to the muscle but acetylcholine is one of them they are called as neurotransmitters so let me write neurotransmitter these are called neurotransmitter okay now here uh, comes the importance of neurotransmitter now neurotransmitters are ready there they are packaged inside a vesicle right so let me talk about it this is the vesicle they are packaged inside now what they are doing here they stay there inside the vesicle until unless they require a signal they achieve a signal from where they can get the signal they can get the signal via a kind of nerve impulse right uh, so let's say there is a nerve impulse. Now, what are nerve impulse? I can't explain in this video right now. But there is a type of nerve impulse which is just change in the membrane potential throughout this nerve ending. Because membrane potential means there is a charge ratio of, uh, of inside the cell, outside the cell, and that charge ratio is getting hampered. It is getting changed. Now, this charge ratio changing is called change in membrane potential. So let let me write membrane. Sorry. So membrane. Let me write membrane potential membrane potential change. So any kind of change in this membrane potential will give rise to a influx of calcium ion inside. Now there are calcium ions outside they are coming right. So let me talk about it. So calcium ions are outside. So a lot of calcium ions that are outside. Calcium, calcium outside. Now there is a rapid influx of calcium ion inside after getting this signal. Now as we are having lots of calcium ion inside, this calcium ion will go and tell this vesicle to be fused with this axon terminal membrane. Right? So it is telling them to fuse with this membrane. So as a result of this fusion of this vesicle with the membrane, it will cause the release of acetylcholine outside. Right? It will cause the release of acetylcholine. Now, these things are also acetylcholine right now. Now, as there are a lot of acetylcholines outside, and there is a receptor for acetylcholine onto the surface of different muscle cells, right? So, not one actually, there are a lot more receptors out there, and the receptor is always, the receptor is always placed there. So, let me draw here, let's say this is the receptor. Let's say this is the receptor and there are a lot of receptors placed there. Now, as the receptors have become ready uh, for all the time. Now here after the release of acetylcholine, this acetylcholine can come and sit onto this receptor and then it, it provides a signal to the muscle to finally contract and then what will occur that the muscle will be contracted. So the muscle will be contracted here. So we are having a muscle contraction, right? We are having a muscle contraction. That's how usually signal comes to construct the muscle. 
right but what happens during the clostridium botulism poisoning now this clostridium botulinum produces the toxin remember the most potent toxin or botulinum toxin now that toxin is interfering with the release or fusion of this vesicle with this axon membrane now i forgot to mention this is axon terminal actually drawing of axon terminal whatever now here this clostridium botulinum toxin is preventing the attachment of this vesicle with the membrane so it is blocking this activity here so here it is the blockage by clostridium botulinum so let me write here it is the blockage by clostridium sorry sorry by botulinum toxin so let me write by botulinum toxin that is the dangerous effect of botulinum toxin it will block the fusion of vesicle with the cell membrane so that as a result of this blockage no further acetylcholine can be released so as a result of not releasing this acetylcholine there is no contraction in the muscle right so contraction will be halted by this contraction will be halted by this botulinum toxin that's the effect of clostridium botulinum toxin in all this case in case of this classical kind of infection or infant or wound infection in all this case this thing is common that it is blocking so let me write it here in star that it blocks the fusion of acetylcholine field vesicle to the exon terminal okay and as a result of that there is no muscle contraction and no muscle contraction means there is no less ability to construct muscle it means it will give rise to flaccid paralysis right flaccid paralysis right so that's how facet paralysis usually occurs and spastic paralysis can be caused by tetanus and it is done via some other mechanisms so that's how the botulinum toxin actually works and actually in any kind of pathogenesis for the clostridium botulinum uh, this botulinum toxin is the major part for causing the infection okay so even if uh, the organism present uh, not present itself but still it can cause disease by secreting and releasing this clostridium botulinum toxin outside right so that's about uh, the pathogenesis and i hope that's helpful thank you now uh, botulinum poisoning is a kind of very dangerous situation so for the treatment of it it is very very different so treatment treatment of it is very very different and it's kind of completely uh, i don't know but it is very difficult to do in many cases because uh, in 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 all these cases if if botulinum toxin is entered so there are two condition one is the infection is onset now usually infection so let me talk infection by bacteria if this occur it will sooner lead to the release of release of toxin so that is very pretty common thing right so toxin will be there and if there is a toxin in blood so let me write if there is a toxin in blood in any how or any condition in those case there is only one way to go against that is to is to detoxify it right so to, for the detoxification so the only way is detoxification so let me write detoxification now the only way we can detoxify is using a kind of antitoxin which is which is made right so we can use one antitoxin right and there is also other kind of mixture of toxins that are generated against uh, different kinds of clostridium toxins i forgot to mention that there are several types of clostridium toxin so there are toxin a toxin b c and up to g there are different levels of clostridium toxin among all these different types of toxin uh, most dangerous are uh, and most general kind of diseases are caused by toxin a b and e so these are these three are most important clinically okay 
So we uh, combine all this A, B, C and A, B, E different kinds of serotype of the bacteria, different types of toxin and we what we produce an antisera in horse, right? So we produce an antisera in horse. So we can administer that. We can administer that in this kind of situation to go against the effect of toxins. But uh, those effects that are already been caused by toxins cannot be reversed back, right? So this is the first kind of thing, detoxification. The second kind of thing that we can do is if the clostridium is infecting your lung tissues or diaphragm in all these cases, it will become very, very hard to survive in those situations. In those cases, you may require mechanical ventilation mechanical ventilation right in those cases you require some kind of mechanical instruments for uh, your respiration and all these things okay so mechanical ventilation is another way of uh, treatment of, of uh, reducing the effect of clostridium toxin and and also if there is a bacterial infection stay for longer period of time in case of let's say in case of wound in case of wound botulism, right? So, in case of wound botulism, what we can do in this case, uh, the individual is infected via the cut in the skin. So, in those cases, we can provide antibiotics, antibiotics, which are killing the bacteria, which are uh, so antibiotics to all those uh, microorganisms which are sensitive to those kind, right? So, antibiotics like penicillin, like penicillin. G and all these things we can provide it okay but this is the last thing that we can do so what we need to do is that we must treat all our food we must process all our food up perfectly so it's a very very important way to prevent clostridium poisoning right otherwise uh, we need to be very careful about the soil contamination so we need to monitor that also and and obviously uh, so and obviously that in case of uh, the onset of this disease, what we can do that if surgical uh, regions, if, if we case, catch this disease from hospitals and all these regions, we need to we need to purify and sterile our components, right? So kind of sterile our components. And for the sterilization, what we can use is heat, right? So among the heat, we can use dry heat or moist heat. And usually, moist heat is proven to be very very effective. Very, sorry. It, it is proven to be very effective, very effective against Clostridium botulinum and botulinum toxin, right? So we can use the moist heat for detoxification purpose. Usually, the moist heat that we are talking about is uh, get it from is is got from what we know as uh, pressure. Along with pressure, we get uh, moist heat. It usually is from autoclave machine, autoclave machine usually okay and so that's how we can prevent this disease but still this disease is very very dangerous thing so you need to be very very careful about this kind of infections okay so that's it and i hope that's helpful thank you